May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the, as a portion of the epistle lesson read earlier from the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 4, where we read again as follows that portion of God's Word which will be the sermon text. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who commanded that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name throughout all the world, their fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating, and preserving triune God. Jesus said that God, quote, maketh his son... S-U-N, to rise on the evil and on the good. He also went on to say, God also sends rain upon the just and the unjust. God makes his sun to shine both upon the evil and the good. Sometimes, maybe even it seems he sends the brightest sunshine on the evil rather than the good. Because, for example, the uh, prophet David, King David, said, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Isn't this amazing? Why is that? Why does God send good things upon unbelievers who don't believe his word? Why does God allow good things to, as David called them, the wicked? Well, many, many people have misinterpreted this over the years. When they see unbelievers prospering and having Good things happen to them in their life. They say, well, see, that proves that God doesn't care about sin. He winks at sin because he allows people who sin without repentance to, to go on and have great things happen to them in this world. You see, God doesn't care what you do. He doesn't care about your sin. What a misinterpretation of God's goodness that is. What a misinterpretation it is, and it's corrected in our text before us today. God tells us here in this verse why he allows good things to happen to those who do not believe his word. He says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, to turn away from sin. God isn't saying, I don't care about sin. When he sends his riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering upon unbelievers, he's not saying, your sin's okay, I don't care. He's saying just the opposite. I'm, I'm showing you my long-suffering and my poor forbearance and my patience and my mercy to you with the hopes it will melt your heart and bring you to repent of your sins. Not go on in them. Put yourself in God's place. You want to save the world. You want to save human beings so much that you would even come down from heaven, become a man, and die for the sins of the world. 
Just think about it for a minute. How much God loves us to do that. What, what, what if you didn't know that? And all you were told was the law of God and the commandments, and, and, and you, you knew, well, I haven't done that. I haven't obeyed God. I've sinned. I've broken his, his laws and thought and word and deed. And that's all you knew. Would you dare to go to God then and say, well, I know I'm a sinner, God, but would you please uh, come down from heaven and become a man and, and die for my sins for me? You wouldn't even dare ask him to do that. But he didn't have to be asked. He did it without us asking him. The great mercy and love of God isn't so that God would say, I don't care about your sin. Whether you sin or not, I'm going to give you good things in this world. Total misinterpretation of why God is merciful and great in his goodness. But put yourself in God's place. You want to save the world. You want everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved, the Bible says, and come to heaven and live with God forever. He wants us all there. But here we are in our sin. What does he do? He says, well, I could get really mean at him, and I could really threaten him. And... But maybe that wouldn't work either. Well, maybe I'll be real kind to them, and maybe they'll repent then. And either way, most people reject him, no matter what he does. What is God to do? If he's really kind to them and blesses them, they think, well, God doesn't care about my sin. If he brings bad things upon them, they curse him. What else is there for God to do? God's goodness to an unbeliever is not to encourage him, it says here in this text, it's not to encourage him in his sin, but meant to woo him away from his sin by God's loving kindness. God says, if I just show them how much I love them, Perhaps they'll come in repentance to me and love me. What a marvel it is. We marvel that God does this to sinners. If we were God, what would we do when someone disobeyed us? We are almighty and they're just a little worm. They're but dust. Why, we could just destroy them. How dare you disobey me? How dare you go on thinking that you can live without me? We marvel that God doesn't do that. Perhaps if we were God, we'd say, the first time, first time a human being sins, we say, all right, that's once. You better not do that again. I'll let you get away with it this one time. And then the second time when they sin, we, we do something terrible to them, short of killing them. Just to warn them again. And then the third time they, they break our commandments, as God, we would just say, that's it, you've had it, you're destroyed, you're in, it, you're in hell. Perhaps that's the way we would be if we were God. That's not the way the true God is at all. He doesn't throw us into hell on our third sin. But rather it says, he is rich in his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering. That's patience. He's patient with us sinners. He puts up with not just three sins, but countless sins on each sinner's part. 
God allows us to sin over and over and over again. You might think, well, okay, if, if a person's trying to not sin, maybe God will be patient with him. But what about these people who just, just spit in God's face? What about these atheists who say, there isn't even a God out there. There's no God. This, this universe created itself. And they just defy that there's a God. Why doesn't God just wipe them off? And yet, you look around and you see even atheists. The most atrocious enemies of God. Being blessed by God. Having blessings shine upon them by God. Instead of wiping them off the face of the earth, God actually gets good things happen to them. How can that be? And then there are some people who are so wicked that you figure, well, the whole world would be better off if they were dead. They're, they're, the whole moral atmosphere of the world would be much purer if God would just kill them. But God doesn't. God allows them to live on. How can that be? This text answers that question. This is the proper interpretation of what God is doing. Some people sin to the point of that they're sinning against themselves. To the point that, that uh, it, makes, it makes them physically sick. Maybe they sin sexually so they get a uh, a, a sexual disease. Or maybe through some other sin, they, they've brought some sickness upon themselves. And yet, God heals them. And we wonder, why didn't God punish them for their sin? Why did he, he, he make them well? And yet, they get well, and what do they do? They go back to their sinning. And maybe they sin more foully than they did before. We as mere mortal human beings, we scratch our heads. and go, How can God spare these people? And yet, we, we, we hear about zealous Christians who give up everything to go to some poverty-stricken place on the face of the earth and give up their lives to serve Jesus Christ by being foreign missionaries. And we see them sickening and dying. And we scratch our heads. God, why do you let these blatant sinners be healed, and your foreign missionaries die. Why is this? Well, this text tells us. This text tells us why God is good to the wicked. Why God is good to sinners. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? He doesn't do them, he doesn't do these good things to the unbelievers as if they are escaping his judgment, because it says in the previous verse, Doest the same that thou, do you think? And thinkest thou this, O man, that doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? No, it's not that they're going to escape ultimately. But he is forbearing, he is long-suffering with them for this one reason. He spares them, he spares the unbelievers and gives them good things in this life and instead of wiping them out. He does this for one reason. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. 
leadeth thee to repentance. Think of it this way. You got a ship. Sailors on the ship. Among these sailors, there's some Christians. There's also some unbelievers, some blasphemers, who take the name of Jesus as a curse word. Ship wrecks in a storm. One of the blasphemers grabs onto a piece of the wreckage of the ship while he sees other sailors sinking around him. He is washed up on the beach and his life is spared. Why? Why does God spare the blasphemer while perhaps the Christians are sinking? The goodness of God should lead that blasphemer to repentance. He should think, why did God spare me? Maybe I should stop my blasphemy and turn to God in repentance. Or take, uh, take a battlefield in a war. Bullets are flying all around, whizzing past your ears, and they, all kinds of soldiers. There's some Christian soldiers, and there's some unbelievers. And so the unbelieving soldiers sitting there, and, and the bullets are whizzing by him and hitting the people next to him, and they're dying. But he's spared. Why? O oh, unbelieving soldier, knowest thou not that the goodness of God should lead thee to repentance? After the battle's over, maybe he should stop and think, why did God spare me? That bullet came that close. Why didn't it kill me? It should lead them to repentance. That's why God does it. It should lead thee to repentance. When we see... When we see God giving to ungodly people, giving to ungodly people perfect health. When we see God giving to ungodly people wealth, what should we think? With each of those blessings, God sends them this message. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. With each blessing, God sends this message. Will you not consider what return should be rendered unto me for this mercy I have shown thee? Will you not turn unto me and praise the giver of all this goodness? Many of the ungodly, and you've seen them, the unbelievers see their children grow up around them, while others have had to bury their children. God is saying to the ungodly, will you not repent of your sin? Will you not turn to Jesus Christ, God the Son, as your only Savior from sin? Will you not have faith in him alone? Don't you know that the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance? Not just repenting of your sin, but turning to Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin. That's why God has mercy on you. God says in the Bible, Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? Heaven is a free gift. Why will you not believe it? Why do you reject it? Jesus is the one way to heaven. Why do you reject him? I am a loving God. I am a merciful God. I am a forgiving God. In Christ Jesus, your sins have been all washed away. Now, some people have said, 
They look around the world and they say, oh, look at these horrible things that are happening in the world. How could he allow that to happen? God must be mean. God must be cruel. He's a bad God. Because look at the things he allows to happen in this world. Why, if there were a God, how could these things exist on the earth? And yet the facts say just the opposite. Here is a person who hasn't prayed to Jesus Christ, hasn't prayed in the name of Jesus, hasn't prayed with faith in Jesus Christ his whole life. Has never prayed in the name of Jesus, with faith in Jesus alone. He's lived in his house all those years without Jesus. And yet, God has sent no fire to burn his house down. How can you call that a mean God? God has sent no thieves to ransack his house. How can you call him unmerciful? Here is another person. He's lived 40 years in this world, or 50, or 60, or 70, or 80 years in this world, and he's never gone to church. Hates church. Don't want anything to do with the Bible. Looks upon it as utter nonsense. And yet he's lived those 80 years. God has allowed him to live in his world those 80 years surrounded with earthly comfort. After all that, can you call God hard? Can you call God cruel? No, the facts clearly show that God is more loving than any human being who has ever lived. Truly, it can be said of God, as the words of Scripture say, He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. He is good. The Bible says of God, He delighteth in mercy. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God says in the Bible, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Bible class, adult Bible class this morning, I talked about John Newton. Said I was going to talk about him in the sermon. Well, here it is. You ever heard of John Newton? John Newton was a sailor back many, many uh, decades ago, back in the slave trade days. He worked on slave ships, bringing slaves from Africa to North America. He did it willingly. He had no problem with it. He was a, a, a profane man. He was a blasphemer. Uh, he had no pity on people. And he, he was a slave trader, sales, uh, a sailor. Well, one day his ship uh, wrecked off the coast of Africa, and he was washed ashore and was captured and was made a slave himself by the natives. And he was a slave, and then finally he, he, he broke loose, he escaped, and he made his way back to his home in England. And there he sat down and he thought, I've lived a horrible life. Selfish, uncaring, cruel, profane, filthy life. But yet God has spared me. God has spared me. Maybe I should start checking into God and seeking God. And so he started going to church, and God guided him to a church where the Bible was preached and taught. And there John Newton was converted, and he repented of his sins. And he became a great preacher of the gospel, and he wrote many hymns. In fact, he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace.
Know ye not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Well, we've talked about ungodly people, unbelievers. Let's talk about believers. Does this text apply to them? You're not an ungodly person. You've come to faith in Jesus Christ. You seek to obey his commandments. You love him and you seek to serve him. Because he first loved you. So, is this a meaningless passage for you? Is this sermon something you can disregard? What does this text have to do with us who are Christians, who have already repented, who have already come to faith? Well, let us remember this. Even though we have come to faith, we are still sinners. Lynn was yesterday preparing her Sunday school lesson, and she called me over and she said, could you explain this Bible verse to me? Remember that, Lynn? It was the Bible verse in the Catechism that says, even Christians sin. Where the Apostle Paul wrote, he hasn't attained perfection yet. He's still pressing on for perfection. He knew he wouldn't reach it until he got to heaven. We are still sinners. What does Advent mean to Christians who have already come to faith? It means we still have more repenting to do. Advent is a season of repentance, even for Christians, not just for unbelievers. And this message also applies to us. We should also know that the goodness of God should lead us to greater repentance, further repentance. But let me think that an heir of wrath like us, who even after we've come to faith and been enlightened by the Holy Ghost and have the Holy Ghost dwelling within us, we are still sinners. And yet God has been so good to us. We still can say, Abba, Father. We can still call God our Father. We should be punished for our sins. We should be cast into hell. We still have this verse applying to us knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. He still is merciful to us. He still doesn't owe us anything. Heaven is still a free gift for us, and we're still sinners. It should lead us to repent more and more. Advent is still important to us, even who are Christians. Should we not be angry with ourselves to think that we should have kept our Father's commands in our, in our minds and served Him with our whole heart rather than just part of our heart? And yet still God is good to us. The more we learn, the more we think, the more we meditate on God's goodness towards us every day, may it always continue to lead us to more and more repentance. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.